You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Johanna from Austria and you are listening to your favorite international podcast. And first off, I have some bad news. Annie is still not feeling too great. So this is the first I'm gonna do this episode by myself. But don't worry, Annie really wished she could be here with us this week. She just has a really bad flare of her fibro. And we send her all our positive thoughts and all of our positive energy and we hope she'll be with us next week again. About last week, thank you so much for being patient with us. We were really not doing great. I was... I don't know. I just couldn't record. I was so sick. I haven't been so sick in a very long time. I was uh, having a real flu. I was running a very high fever for days. And even though I'm mostly exhausted and still sleeping most of the time, uh, also, my apologies, my voice might be still a little bit rough. Uh, my brain is still not working properly. So I hope all my notes for this episode today do make sense. I tried my best. Yeah, but we missed you guys. Thank you so much for all your messages and love and support and for all of your photos of your pets that you posted in the Facebook group to cheer us up. Because it really worked. I really looked at all the photos. I didn't write a lot uh, in the last couple of weeks in the group. I was just, yeah, mostly sleeping and wasn't great. On a happier note, a special shout out to our newest Patreon members and they are Dana McKay, Denali, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Jennifer Rittenhouse, Carrie Greaves, Sarah Brent Casper, Christina Preston and Pamela Elliott. Thank you so much for your support. As soon as Annie and I are feeling better again, we will, we will record two more episodes uh, for April for our Patreon members. We're also gonna post the date for our murder tier game night soon. So, as I said, I'm gonna do this alone this week, which is super scary, especially as Annie did such an amazing job the last time about the disaster of Los Alfaques. She really made me cry and laugh a lot while I was editing. So this is uh, scary for me. I've never done this alone, all by myself. I hope I'm gonna be 10% as good as Annie is. I'm probably not, but I'm gonna give my best. This week I want to tell you the story of a disappearance. You know, that's something that's often on my mind. This one took place over 110 years ago and it's still a mystery. And it's considered to be the first high-profile missing person case in the United States. And as always, when it's a mystery, I will first tell you everything I know and then I talk about the common theories and... Maybe I will make up my mind along the way what I think happened, because so far I have absolutely no idea. Some content warning for this episode. Uh, I will be talking about suicide and I will be mentioning abortion. So if that is a sensitive topic for you, you might want to sit this one out. All right, so this all takes place in New York in 1910, which is pretty much the end of the Edwardian era. And if that time period interests you, I want to suggest that you also go and listen to our episode 29 about Evelyn Nesbitt and the murder of Stanford White, because we talk quite a bit about the Gilded Age, the Edwardian era, especially in New York. Yeah, if you're interested in royal sex furniture, you will also be pleased with that episode. But today we won't talk about such erotic contraptions and... I'm sorry, but I'm never gonna let a chance to mention that sex chair slip away from me. So there you go. <laughs> I will be talking about a New York socialite by the name of Dorothy Harriet Camille Arnold and about the day she vanished. Dorothy was born on 1st of July 1885 as the second of a total of four children to Frances Rose Arnold and Mary Martha Parks Arnold and she was a born Samuels. She had one older brother named John who was born in 1884 and two younger siblings, Dan Hickley who was born in 1888 and then the youngest one, Sister Marjorie who was born in 1891. The family can be considered very well off. 
Dorothy's father, who had graduated from Harvard University, was the senior partner of F.R. Arnold and Co. Uh, that was a company that imported and traded so-called fancy goods or fine goods. And as far as I read, the F.R. Arnold and Co. mostly traded with perfume, but also expensive fabrics, delicacies and the likes. And as it is often the case with those wealthy East Coast families, you could trace Francis Rose Arnold's ancestors back all the way to the Mayflower and to its 102 passengers who reached the shores of Massachusetts in 1620. To be exact, the Arnolds could be traced back to William Brewster, who had left the old continent with his wife and two sons. Annie told me that Brewster, the town where she grew up, was named after William Brewster and that there are plenty of prominent families who go back to the Mayflower. So Dorothy was living the luxury life of a New York socialite. She attended the Veltin School for Girls, which is a private school that had been founded in 1886 in Manhattan, and the students were educated in French, literature, art. But what I found very interesting is that they were also educated in physics, astronomy, and physiology, for example. And after the Veltin School, Dorothy attended the and here comes a Welsh name, Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, which is a women's liberal arts college, and it's still a very small and prestigious school. It's one of the seven sisters from back when Ivy League school were, you know, men only, and Catherine Hepburn attended that college. Dorothy majored in literature and language, and she graduated in 1905. She left college with the dream of moving out of her family home on 108 East and 79th Street, and she wanted to become a writer. She had actually wanted to move to Greenwich Village, uh, but of course her parents were not amused, they were not in favor of her moving out. Her father pretty much told her that, quote, a good writer can write anywhere, end quote, and that she will stay living with them until she got married. And all in all, it looks as if her family and friends were more kind of amused by Dorothy's dream of becoming a writer. They did not actively encourage her, but I, I, I think they saw it more of a cute little hobby that she could waste some time on until it was time for her to get married and have children, you know, to run a household, dedicate herself to charity work and, and all the things. And when I say running a household, I of course mean that she had to manage the household aids. A woman in the societal circle of Dorothy Arnold would of course not clean and wash, but she was busy anyway. In 1903, there was a book published called Millionaire Households and the Domestic Economy with Hints Upon Fine Living by the author Mary Elizabeth Carter. And in this book, the author tells young American heiresses everything they needed to know to run their home with the help of butlers and maids. So this is now an excerpt of the book. It's great. Very interesting. I found it interesting and that's why you have to hear it. Quote, the society woman soon realizes that the personal charge of her house is impossible if she would hold her own in the world of fashion. No man of varied and engrossing business affairs would permit himself to be burdened with housekeeping. Neither can his wife or daughter, as the case may be, combine the two roles of society leader and home caretaker and reasonably expect to succeed in both or either. Therefore, the managing housekeeper has become necessary in all large and elaborate establishments if they are to be conducted with propriety. Her presence relieves the hostess from the general superintendents as well as from petty details and leaves her free to pursue a routine of entertaining and being entertained, to enjoy herself when and where she pleases, to travel at will or indulge her whims and fads in whatever way the gay world of society and her own inclination may lead or tempt her. Sounds pretty nice to me, actually. The quote continues. A hostess conversant with the proprieties who, therefore, knows how to conduct herself in her own house, enjoys immunity from hampering household cares. She need never know when changes occur in the servant department unless the change be among those with whom she comes in contact. Even then, she need only be informed of the new servant's name and may be as free to enjoy herself as any one of the guests at her endless dinner and house parties. Even when she requires a new personal maid, all the care of finding one and of looking up her references will be done for her. She has only to see a desirable applicant and decide the final question of engaging. But let no one suppose that the mistress of millions of money and many earthly mansions is a woman of leisure. This is very far from the case. She is often one of the hardest worked members of the community. It must be confessed, this is chiefly her own choice and not a matter of compulsion unless devotion to pleasure be regarded as compulsory. 
that she seldom gets any old-fashioned beauty sleep is owning to the constant round of entertainments in which she takes part, either as hostess at home or guest elsewhere. However, the skillful masseuse, the complexion renovator, is as regularly employed as the manicure and hairdresser. Wrinkles are out of date for all who will pay to have them rubbed out scientifically. End quote. I didn't know you can rub out wrinkles scientifically. I think I have to look into that. So this is the world Dorothy Arnold lives in, but as we said, she wants more. She wants to be a writer, she wants to live as she pleases, and she also wants to love whom she pleases. And that's a whole other problem in the Arnold family. Because Dorothy was somewhat romantically involved with a 44-year-old wealthy engineer from Pittsburgh named George Griscom Jr., and he laughed it when people called him Junior, even though he was heading towards 50. Uh, the two had met during Dorothy's college years, but Dorothy's family did not approve of this relationship and George was never ever going to be allowed to propose to Dorothy. And I will get into why the Arnolds didn't consider Criscom to be, you know, a good son-in-law material soon. But first, Dorothy and George had done something scandalous. In the late summer of 1910, the two had spent a week together in Boston. So Dorothy, who had been spending the summer vacation with her family in Maine, had asked for permission to go to Cambridge for a week to meet a former college classmate, a girl by the name of Theodora Bates. But that was far from the truth, because Dorothy didn't go to Cambridge, and she didn't meet Theodora. She had gone to Boston to groom at the Hotel Lennox under her real name, and then she spent a whole week with her beau, Junior. The two looked happy and cheerful whenever they were seen in public together, and towards the end of this romantic week, Dorothy went to a pawn shop and pawned some of her jewelry, again using her real name, and I assume she needed money to pay for her stay. You know, money that her family didn't know about. Her family, I think, wouldn't find out about any of this Boston trip for another few months. But... More about that later. What else can I tell you about Dorothy? As I said, she aspired to be a novelist, and she did send short stories to magazines, but all of her stories were rejected. At one point, Dorothy even rented a mailbox because she didn't want her family to know about her trials and failures in the literary world. And I think that's also the reason why she wanted to move out of her family home to an apartment in Greenwich Village. Not only for privacy reasons, but also because she probably hoped to find inspiration in the already rather bohemian flair of the village. Okay, so now we get to the day of Dorothy's disappearance. It was 12th of December 1910 and Dorothy told her mother that she would go out shopping. So she was looking for a dress that she could wear for her sister Marjorie's debutante ball and Dorothy's mother suggested that she would accompany her oldest daughter but Dorothy replied, quote, No mother, don't bother, you don't feel just right and it's no use going to the trouble. I mightn't see a thine I want but if I do I'll phone you, end quote. On AmericanHeritage.com we find an explicit description of what Dorothy Arnold was wearing that day. Quote, that day she wore a well-tailored suit with a blue serge coat and a tight hobble skirt in a matching collar. She carried both a huge silver fox mutt and a satin handbag. But by far the most conspicuous feature of her attire was her hat. It was made of black velvet with two blue roses for decoration, a type then called a baker, which resembles nothing much as an overturned dishpan. The lining of this oversized chapeau was Alice Blue, the maker's name was Genevieve, and along its edge, rimming Dorothy his pleasant open face ran a fetching bit of a scalloped lace, end quote. I also read that the flowers on the head, the roses on the head were white, not blue. So she was wearing a purse, she was wearing the, the fox muff because it was December in New York and you don't want your fingers to fall off. And in her purse she had $25 that was part of her weekly allowance of $100. Telling her mother goodbye, Dorothy left her home and walked up 79th Street towards 5th Avenue. And now you might ask yourself why a wealthy girl was walking all that way on a cold December day. Uh, first of all, if she walked up 79th Street, the first part of her, of her walk was only 0.2 miles, so that's 3 kilometers. Second, she was a healthy young woman and walking was pretty much her only physical activity, so we can assume that she enjoyed the short walk in the somewhat fresh air, even though it was windy that day, the streets might have been even a little bit slippery. 
When she reached 5th Avenue, she turned left and headed 1.2 miles south to park in Tilford's on 59th Street, where she purchased a box of chocolate and this box of chocolate was charged to her family store account and she then put it in her muff and continued her way. Her next stop was Brentano's bookstore, 0.7 miles from Park and Tilford's. In the bookstore she browsed for a little bit before she purchased a book called Engaged Girl Sketches by Emily Calvin Blake. This is a collection of humorous short stories that revolve around girls who are in different stages of courtship up until engagement. Uh, again, this purchase was charged to the family account. Then, around 2pm on the sidewalk outside of Brentano's, Dorothy ran into an acquaintance, a girl named Gladys King, and Gladys and Dorothy did chat for a couple of minutes, Gladys handled Dorothy the RSVP to Marjorie Arnold's debutante party, and joked about how lucky she was that she saved the money for stamps by running into Dorothy. Gladys then told Dorothy that she had to run now. She was meeting her mother for lunch at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, we talked about the Waldorf Astoria in our Empire State Building episode, I think. Dorothy mentioned that she might walk back home through Central Park. And with this, the two girls said goodbye. Gladys walked a few steps, then stopped, turned around and waved one last goodbye to her friend Dorothy. And this is probably the last time that Dorothy Arnold was ever seen. At least it is the last confirmed sighting of Dorothy Arnold. Let's pause here for a quick word by our sponsor, because this episode is brought to you by Best Fiends. If you're one of our regular listeners, you already know that we love to take a break from researching murder, mystery and the macabre by playing a few rounds of Best Fiends. This fun mobile puzzle game is the perfect distraction, the characters are so cute, the levels are challenging but never frustrating, and there are tons of new puzzles added constantly. So it never gets boring or repetitive. If you are already playing Best Fiends, and are looking for more in-game friends, you will find a pin post in our Facebook group. It's great! People are comparing their levels and add each other in-game. We also all have our own personal favorite fiend that we train and build up to defeat the slugs. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this game. So join me and millions of people who are already playing this fun puzzle game. Download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R. Best fiends. Okay, so to recap, Dorothy Arnold left her family home in the late morning on 12th of December 1910. She then walked up uh, 79th Street down 5th Avenue in total roughly 5 kilometers, a little bit over 2 miles from her home to Brentano's. Okay, so now I personally, I love to walk. I walk halfway through Vienna without a problem. And yes, the weather that day was not pleasant. It was windy, it was chilly, the sidewalks might have been slippery. And we guess we can all imagine her attire. I mean, of course we can, because I just read the description of her clothes. But also in terms of shoes, I guess buttoned up boots with a little heel. Not the best footwear for the weather that day, but still. Two miles, 2.5 miles with a couple of stops on the way. It's, it's easily doable. It's nothing I find out of the ordinary. And the last that anybody heard was that she had planned to walk home through Central Park. And... I will post a map where I will mark her route. Walking through Central Park is not a shortcut as far as I can see. I guess she wanted to walk through there to enjoy the scenery. And I don't know if you knew, but Central Park was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. If you read The Devil in the White City, the book about H.H. H. Holmes and the uh, World Fair, uh, might sound familiar. He was the landscape architect who designed Central Park and a lot of people mistakenly think that, you know, Central Park was just land no one developed, but the park was actually designed to appeal to the eye at every turn. So yeah, it's no surprise that Dorothy might have wanted to take a walk through the park rather than going again up north on Fifth Avenue. Now in the Arnold home, dinner is about to be served and Dorothy hasn't come home yet and this seems to be very unusual. She would normally phone to let her family know if she was running late, so the family starts to call Dorothy's friends and they ask them if their daughter is by any chance over at their house, but nobody has seen Dorothy. The family now urges to be really discreet about the call and not to mention it to anybody. And I think this seems weird for us modern day people, but I think if we look at it from, you know, New York f millionaire families at the turn of the century point of view, it makes a little bit of sense. I doubt that they immediately were worried that something had happened to Dorothy. I mean, she was out shopping on one of the busiest streets in the whole country, two miles from her home. 
what could have possibly happened. If there would have been an accident, they would have been informed by now. So maybe they were worried that she was out with a suitor, you know, probably George Jr., and of course, they wanted no word of this out in public. So the family calls around looking for Dorothy, but nobody has seen her. And later that night, one of those friends actually calls the Arnold home to see if Dorothy has returned. And Mrs. Arnold tells her that, yes, Dorothy is home and everything is fine. And she had come home and she went straight to bed because she was suffering a headache. Of course, that was a lie. Dorothy still hadn't returned. Many people find this lie very weird, even suspicious. But again, I think it was out of fear of a scandal. They might have thought that she was out with a man. Maybe they had already heard rumors before about Dorothy's week in Boston, you know, that previous summer. So that's why they didn't want anybody to know that she still wasn't home after midnight, that she was out the whole night. The next morning, Francis Arnold decides to not inform the police, but instead he calls John S. Keith, who is a junior partner, in the law firm that was representing the Arnolds and he's asked to come over to the Arnold home and when John arrives he's informed about Dorothy being missing and he then goes to her room to take a look around and everything seems to be there only the clothes she was wearing and her purse are missing. They also find personal letters with foreign post stamps as well as two transatlantic steamship folders and in the fireplace he finds what he assumes to be the burned remains of one of Dorothy's manuscripts, but there's nothing to decipher there. So it's not 100% confirmed that it was a manuscript, it's just assumed. And the, the thought is that she probably had just received the manuscript back with yet another rejection letter. So now the lawyer offers to look into hospitals, morgues, sanatoriums and the like for Dorothy, because the father still refused to get the police involved. Even though John looks at countless patients and unidentified bodies and whatnot, there's no sign of Dorothy. Nothing could be found. So next, they decide to get the Pinkertons involved. And I don't know why, but I always get excited whenever I read a book or an article and the infamous Pinkertons make an appearance. If you don't know, the Pinkerton National Detective Agency was founded in 1850 and they were involved in so many high-profile cases. They were hired, for example, to track famous authors like Jesse James, Butch Cassidy, Sundance Kid. I think they were involved in the Lindbergh case that we covered. It's been so long. I think they were also mentioned there. They are also so tightly woven into pop culture nowadays. You know, Pinkerton detectives make appearances in literature like in Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, movies from James Bond to 310 to humor or TV like in Deadwood. The Pinkertons are a piece of history that ties so many things kind of together, you know, does it make any sense? I just, I find it so fascinating. Maybe we should do a whole Pinkerton episode. Sorry for going off on that tangent, but I just, yeah, <laughs> that's me going down rabbit holes with the Pinkertons. Okay, so the Arnolds contact the Pinkertons and now Finally, end of January 1911, several weeks after Dorothy's disappearance, the police is finally informed and a description of the missing woman is mailed out to several police stations all over the country. They also offer a reward of $1,000. I read that this would be $22,000 nowadays. Doesn't sound like too much for such a wealthy family, but I think that's just because it was the first reward they offered. You can't just start out with $1 million, you know. And then, on 25th of January, Francis R. Arnold finally, finally brings himself to take his lawyers and the Pinkerton's advice, and the press is informed about the disappearance of Dorothy H. C. Arnold. And this interview he gives, or this press conference, however you want to call it, it's interesting to say the least. So it seems that Mr. Arnold wanted to be done with the reporters as quickly as possible. He tells them how kind of boring Dorothy's life was that she was not one to go out a lot or to have a lot of friends and he tells them from the start or pretty much from the start that his daughter is missing but that he is convinced that she's dead and that this is all and you know they don't have to report anything else no speculations nothing nothing that could cause a scandal Francis tells them that he's convinced that Dorothy walked home through Central Park and that she was met with foul play. He says, quote, 
Assuming that she walked up home through Central Park, she could have taken the lonely walk along the reservoir. There, because of the laxity of police supervision over the park, I believe it quite possible that she might have been murdered by garroters and her body thrown into the lake or the reservoir. Such atrocious things do happen, though there seems to be no justification for them." End quote. And with this, the press conference was over. Or at least that's what Francis Arnold hoped for, because... <laughs> no. The reporters are not satisfied. The nosy journalists keep asking questions. Can you believe this audacity? Reporters asking questions at a press conference. And so they ask him if he thought that maybe she had run off with a man and that maybe he, Francis Arnold, had objected to Dorothy meeting men or having courtship and that was the reason why she ran off. And Francis Arnold replies, quote, It is not true that I objected of her having men call at the house. I would have been glad to see her associate more with young men than she did, especially some young men of brains and position, one whose profession or business would keep him occupied. I don't approve of young men who have nothing to do. End quote. So with this, he very clearly referred to Dorothy's beau, George C. Griscom Jr. And remember that I said I will come back to why the Arnolds didn't approve of him as a suitor for Dorothy? Well, there you have it. Apparently, Jr. was exactly that. A junior. A son of a wealthy family who had no interest in working hard. And I don't mean physically hard working, but, you know, running a business. He was apparently more interested in enjoying life and his family's fortune. Now, the press also figured out quickly who Arnold was talking about and they also discovered Dorothy's week she had spent with him in Boston. And I think... That's when her family heard about this for the first time, but I could be wrong. It could also be possible that they knew about it before, or that at least they had some kind of suspicion. But you know, now they really saw it all laid out in front of them. The hotel she had checked in, the pawn shop, all under her real name, and what a scandal! And where was Junior, you might ask? Was he around frantically looking for Dorothy? Nope. He wasn't. He had been on a European vacation with his parents because, yes, Junior always traveled with his parents. And while staying in Florence, a telegram from the Arnold family reached him, informing him of Dorothy gone missing and begging him to tell them if he knew about her whereabouts. And he replied with, quote, No, absolutely nothing, Junior, end quote. And then, one day, a young man and a mysterious woman who hid her identity behind the wheel came to see Junior in Florence. The three spent a couple of hours together and then the young man and the mysterious woman left with a pack of letters. Now, there was a lot of speculation going on about who this couple was and many believed and some still believe that the whaled woman was Dorothy Arnold herself. But it looks as if it was actually Dorothy's oldest brother, John, and their mother, Mary Martha Parks Arnold. And they had made the long journey to Europe to talk to Junior directly, asking him if he knew anything, and George swore he knew nothing. But he insisted that he would ask for Dorothy's hand as soon as she returned from wherever she was, and Mrs. Arnold immediately said that there was no way absolutely no way he would ever marry their daughter. I mean, she might be missing and we worry about her well-being, but that doesn't mean we will allow her to marry whoever she wants once she returns. Now, in one of the letters that Junior had returned to the Arnolds, Dorothy talks about how she had received yet another rejection from a magazine. She wrote, quote, Well, it has come back. McClure's has turned me down. All I can see ahead is a long road with no turning. Mother will always think an accident has happened. End quote. On 9th of February 1911, Junior and his family returned to New York and now Junior tries to find Dorothy. He placed ads in newspapers urging Dorothy to contact him, but he never received one word that was believed to be from Dorothy. I think the, the thing that usually happens, you know, also happened here, people faked letters or tried to involve themselves into the case. Uh, at one point, the Arnold family received a postcard saying, I'm safe. And the handwriting was believed to be Dorothy's handwriting, but Mr. Arnold was 100% certain that it was faked. The Pinkertons continued their search, the Central Park Reservoir and the lakes, they were searched several times. Nobody was ever found. They kept visiting hospitals, sanatoriums, morgues. They talked to women who had lost their memory through accidents or illness. But it was all in vain. Dorothy Arnold could not be found. So that's what we know. And let's talk about theories, shall we? 
One of the theories is that she slept on the icy sidewalk, hit her head and suffered from amnesia. I think it's possible, but the hospitals and morgues were searched, nobody on the busy streets saw her slip or saw a, wo saw a woman slip, no unknown woman with a concussion was found that day in the area of 5th Avenue or Central Park. You know, I just, I think it's possible, it's, I just don't think that's what happened here. Uh, the next theory is she was drugged and abducted. Because apparently that was something that wasn't very uncommon in New York of the early 20th century. I think it's possible, but she was on a busy street and she was seen by acquaintances and store clerks. Now, if that happened in Central Park, for example, I think if she would have been a middle-class woman or a working-class woman and she would have been abducted, I would assume she would have been trafficked, right? But... Her clothes alone indicated that she was a very wealthy woman. And I think then it would have been for ransom, right? And there was never any ransom asked for. I mean, it's possible but unlikely, because what's the point of abducting a very wealthy looking woman if there's no ransom, right? The next theory, that's something Junior thought that happened. He thought that she might have died by suicide because of her failing writing career or maybe because the family did not approve of her relationship. That was because uh, Junior had a cousin who had jumped off a ship and committed suicide that way because the family forbid their relationship. Why was her body never found then? So... She did not commit suicide at Central Park because the reservoir and the lakes were searched several times. That day, the water was even frozen, so it makes no sense that she fell in or jumped in there. Then they thought, because they found the two vouchers or the, the, the papers for the transatlantic steamship, that she had gone on one of these ships and, you know, jumped into the water somewhere in the Atlantic. They checked... They didn't find any person or any ship that reported a missing passenger. Also, you would have to register with your name if you go on a ship like this. But there is another possibility that Dorothy went on a Fall River sidewheeler, which left New York every day at 5 p.m. And that was an overnight boat. And... Many people who wanted to commit suicide or committed suicide favored this ship or this boat because there was no passenger list. You know, people just walked aboard, chose a cabin, paid and, you know, could jump off the ship somewhere during the night. One of the things that many people believe speaks against the suicide theory is because everybody who met her that day said she was in such a good mood. She was so cheery. Of course, that could firstly just mean that she was good at faking her emotions or maybe that she was in a good mood because she did have the suicide plans. Some people don't know that, but uh, it's not uncommon for people who finally made a plan to die by suicide to be very, you know, happy, upbeat, positive because they made the decision to commit suicide. So that can often be an alarming sign if somebody has been depressed for a very long time and all of a sudden without, you know, medication, without seeing a therapist, they are upbeat. So yeah, I think that's a possibility. Another theory is that uh, she actually was pregnant and she went to an abortion clinic, an illegal abortion clinic, of course, and that she died during an abortion and her body then was cremated in the illegal abortion clinic or that she was buried somewhere which I also think is a possibility. Because, of course, we also have this story. And I'm gonna read to you a newspaper clipping from the Republic Columbus, Indiana, from 17th of April, 1916, and this appeared on page 3. Quote, New York, April 17th. The New York police this afternoon expected to investigate, but were skeptical of the story of Rhode Island state convict that he helped bury Dorothy Arnold, New York heiress, who disappeared mysteriously six years ago. The missing girl's father, Francis R. Arnold, regarded the convict story as utter nonsense. Edward Glenoris, an inmate of the state prison at Providence, made the confession moved, he said, by troubled conscience and the fact that he got religion a few weeks ago. Glenoris said the girl died as the result of an operation. He said he and another man were hired 
to help bury her and that he was paid $250. A wealthy New Yorker, he said, sent a taxi cab to a 7th Avenue salon in New York where arrangements were made for the secret burial. I think... I think that's one of these cases where somebody, a convict, um, just, you know, wants to feel kind of important or wants to get a deal. And, you know, I don't think there is anything to that story. He even told them basements of houses where he thought that was the house where he buried her and if police searched and they found nothing. I think that was a creep. He just liked the attention. And we know these kind of things happen way too often, right? Another theory, did she run off and start a new life away from her family? It's possible. I don't think she would have done that. Uh, first of all, she had $25 with her. Nothing of her jewelry or her her more valuable possessions were missing. Not as far as I know, not as far as the Arnolds found out, I think. I don't know. No, I don't think she would have done that. But I could be completely wrong, of course. So yeah, these are the main theories. I think most of them can make sense. If I would have to guess, I would say the suicide is very likely or that she was met with foul play. You know, as it often is the case with these high-profile missing person cases, people continue to report sightings of Dorothy. Nothing ever came from it. I know that, for example, 25 years after her disappearance, people were still reporting that they just saw her on Fifth Avenue, uh, which I think is unlikely because 25 years, I don't think you would recognize a person you have never really seen, just know from the newspapers after 25 years, right? But still, police was always sent. They were then standing there for hours on Fifth Avenue, staring at the people passing by, but of course never found anything. Now, how about the Arnold family? So, Dorothy's mother, she believed or she hoped that Dorothy was still alive and that she would return one day. Dorothy's father, on the other hand, he always publicly stated that he believed that she was dead, that she actually died that day that she went missing. Even though he did spend a quarter of a million dollars, you know, to try and find her, but I think that was more for his wife. But when he then died on 6th of April 1922, in his will, he intentionally made no provisions for Dorothy, stating that he was, quote, satisfied that she is not alive, end quote. So yeah, that's the, that's the story of Dorothy Arnold, her disappearance. I don't know, what do you guys think? What happened to her? Uh, you can come to the Facebook group, you can send us messages, you can write us on Instagram. Tell us your theory. Do you think that she died by suicide, that she was met with foul play, that she died during an abortion, or that she ran off and lived happily ever after uh, somewhere writing her short stories and being finally able to live her life the way she wanted? Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. I know this was weird. Me being here alone without any, I miss talking to her. Let's all hope we'll be back to normal next week. Don't worry, we're not gonna stop the podcast. Some messages arrived where they said, are you gonna quit the podcast? Is Annie gonna quit the podcast? Are you gonna stop doing the podcast? No, we're not. We're both gonna be back to normal soon enough. <clears throat> My voice is leaving me, as you can hear. So, yes, please come back next week. If you have a few seconds and you like our podcast, please do us the huge favor and rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us out so much. Come to Facebook, discuss with us our episodes. Post, please, your pet photos. We really love to see your pets. Go to www.freshhellpodcast.com. There you find all the links to our merch store, to our Patreon, to our PO box, email, whatever way you need that you can contact us, you're going to find it there. And please tell your pets we love them, we miss them, hug them, cuddle them, be as kind as you can to them. And... Until next week, if you yourself are going through hell, man, it feels weird to say this because I never do. Keep going. Tschüss.